Great. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday School class this week. We're continuing our study in Romans. We're, we didn't focus this week on chapter 4, but this week's lesson covers chapters 4 through uh, the beginning of chapter 5. We'll go through the first 11 verses of chapter 5, which are the verses that we're going to concentrate on today to look at. But um, We pick up with 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we also, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So another translation of this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our conf confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So it, we start out here talking about being justified by faith. And chapter 4 was talking about explaining how Abraham was justified in righteousness by God because of his faith. And, and we too are, are credited with righteousness in believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And so that's what is being spoken of here and referring back to chapter 4. Therefore, therefore being justified by faith, we're justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. In the text here, our, the author says, By God's grace we are forgiven and declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. Now the relationship we were created to enjoy with our God our Father has been restored, and we are reunited with Him forever. We stop and think about, I mean, now the relationship we were created to enjoy with God our Father has been restored and we are reunited with Him forever. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. We talked about this. They, they walked with God. They, they communed with Him. They talked with They visited because they knew no sin at that point at the beginning. And it's just... It troubles me to stop and think about this statement here that says the relationship we were created to enjoy with God our Father. God created us and his whole intent from the, from the get-go was for us to be in his presence. But yet he knew we'd mess that up. I mean, how many people do you know that if you knew that the... That the if you developed a relationship with this person that at some point down the road they would destroy it. They would just make things so bad that, that you couldn't be together. So how many of us would move forward with that relationship if we knew that it was going to end in a train wreck? <coughs> Particularly them doing something against us them doing something that we couldn't be around them anymore. So how many of us would move forward to develop that relationship? Probably be fair to say none of us would. And that's what strikes me when we talk about this and we think about this, that we were created to enjoy with God our Father has been restored and we are reunited with Him forever. He created everything. And he created Adam and Eve, knowing what Adam was going to do. And he moved forward with it. And 
he it's just it's just hard to wrap your mind around God's calls down everything and creates everything but he knew before he ever made the first utterance before he ever spoke anything into being he knew exactly where we'd be he knew exactly that i'd be standing here this morning confused and, and hard to express just exactly what he did for us he knew all this and yet he did he knew that our relationship was is nothing better than a train wreck with him except for jesus christ except for his son and what they were willing to do for each and every one of us. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus won peace for us. Now, that's a good way to put it, too. He won peace. Our life is... He won peace for us. You know what the alternative to that is? The alternative is God's wrath. You want to know the opposite of peace? It's God's wrath. You think that we see problems here on earth as being bad we we see wars being bad we see imagine the worst thing that you can imagine that that is experienced here on earth here and now and and that people see and that people experience the worst thing that you can see or that you can imagine pales in comparison to god's wrath and that's what jesus has done for us he's given us a pass on god's wrath He's given us peace instead of God's wrath if we believe what he did for us. We were enemies of God because of our sins, but since Jesus took care of our sins on the cross, we are no longer enemies. This guy's got a real good way of putting things, doesn't he? It just really makes you feel. <laughs> we were enemies. Who's going to have a relationship with somebody that you know you're going to wind up being enemies? And but but that was us. That is us. That's the loss. Enemies of God. God loves them, but they're still enemies in that you can't be in a relationship with God. You can't be in the presence of God unless someone pays the price for my sin, your sin, our sin, their sin. And that's what Jesus has done. Because of God's grace. And then he goes on to talk about not only so we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, because the Holy Spirit is with us. We, when he talks about glory and tribulations, that's always a tough one too. You know, and we're supposed to count it all joy. We're supposed to be glad that we have problems in our life. That sometimes, whose first response when your problem crops up is, "Oh joy, oh good, I'm happy, I'm I'm glad." <clears throat> not it because usually the first thing I think about was did they bring this on themselves have we already talked about this have they brought this problem because they didn't listen to me is that why we have this problem we're dealing with and I shouldn't do that but I hope that's human nature because that's my nature and I need to I know I need to fix it but too often that's the first path I head down Somebody comes to that's it's what you do you not feel like some days all you do all day long is fix other people's problems? Well, you know what? If other people didn't have these problems that needed help fixing and needed you to help fix them, maybe God don't need you around. I mean, what 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 are you here for? What are we here for? What am I here for? I'm here to bring honor and glory to God, although I don't do such a good job of it. But, you know, maybe the fact that they keep rolling at you 
the fact that they keep piling up on you. Maybe somewhere along the way we did something right. Maybe I did a little something right, and God says, okay, you took care of that one. How about this one? You know? So that's what we're talking about, tribulations. And as you have these problems come your way, as you work through these things, do you not get a little better at it? Do you not get a little stronger? Do you not look back and say, hey, something similar to this before we've done, and I'm, I, I, I know how to take care of this. I know how to fix it. And that's what he's talking about here. They, it helps us to learn patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. As we move through this, we get stronger. We get stronger in our faith. We get better in sharing with the world around us. We get we become a better witness for God. And all the while, we have the Holy Spirit within our heart to guide us, to direct us, to help us through this, to remind us of, hey, now this, you know, you're here for a reason. You're here for God. You're here to take care of this because God knows you can take care of this through Him. You can do this. Being justified by God through Jesus Christ means the Holy Spirit will be with us until we enter into God's presence. There's a strong, encouraging statement from our author here as well. You know Jesus Christ is your Savior. The Holy Spirit indwells within you. And whatever tribulations come our way, whatever lesson God wants us to learn today, whatever we're going to get to experience the privilege of, of dealing with to help us get a little closer in relationship to God, whatever that is, we're not going to be doing it alone. And it's not just that we can call on God and talk to Him about it. It's that the Holy Spirit is within us, that God's in us and going to direct us. He, he doesn't direct us from afar. He doesn't direct us from his word here and we have to go and search and find the answer and here and know that that's what he wants us to do. He directs us from within. He will lead us from, from within our own heart. So verses 6 through 8. When we were, for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet preadventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. In our text here, this the author says, if a husband wants to show his love for his wife, he will not simply tell her he has feelings of love for her. He will tell her, but a wise husband will show his wife how much he loves her. It's always nice to use an example. Husbands and wives to start with there. But, yeah, your wife doesn't want you to just tell her that you love her. She wants you to show it. And, and the same is, is true. A husband doesn't want the wife to just say, I love you. He wants her to show him. Your friends don't want you to just say, hey, you're my friend, you know, and this and that, what have you. They want you to show it to them. They have a problem. They want you to respond and, and, and be a help to them. And not even necessarily them to have to ask for it. They would much rather that you just saw a need and you answered to that need and you helped them. A husband and a wife, that relationship, the wife doesn't want the husband to come to her and say, okay, give me your list of chores today. And let me see that honeydew list and I'll get started on it. The wife would much prefer the husband to recognize the needs as well as she does and go and do something about it. Go and take care of them. And it, go, it goes both ways, but... But that's what strong relationships are about. There's a lot of unspoken communication. There's a lot of understanding and, and need being seen by both of them. And that's what 
Christ died for the ungodly because he knew that's what he needed to do. God knew that we were all, that we all needed someone to pay the price for us because none of us were worthy. None of us could live a sinless life. So there is a cost for sin. And someone has to pay that cost. And Jesus was willing to do that. <laughs> says fostering strong relationships requires more than emotions. God knows this much better than we do. Paul reminded the reader that Jesus died for humanity while everyone was actively rebelling against him. As he says here, for scarcely a righteous man will, will one die. So basically what he's saying is there's not anybody going to die for somebody that, that you deem unworthy. But there's a few people out there, if they thought somebody was good enough, that they might die for them. You know, there's, there's times when a human, you know, one of us, one, one of God's children, will see somebody and step out and, and risk their life for someone else if they thought they were worthy. You, know, you see a little kid step out in the street, you're not going to think twice about it. Stepping out there and jumping and grabbing that kid. And even if it took you pushing them back and, you know, maybe getting hit by a car or something. But there's times when you would you would risk your injury to yourself or life, your life, for someone else if you thought that they deserved it. And it goes through your mind just real quick. You, but we have time to stop and think about it and then we start putting unfortunately we start we start grading it is it worth it or is, is it worth us to do that there's there's actuaries out there there's there's companies that have problems and they might cause death or harm to someone and they'll stop and they'll They'll put a pencil to it, and they'll try to decide, is it worth the effort and expense of making this change, or would it cost us less to just go over here and pay for those that are injured uh, in dealing with this? Which, which factor is going to be the, the least impediment to us? You know, wh which way can we get out of here the easiest? And they'll make that determination. Thankfully, God doesn't think that way. Because if he did, none of us would have any hope whatsoever. So what would it cost versus all of these folks over here that would be, you know, could be helped? What would it cost? The greatest cost ever. Nothing. It, it would be like there's, there's absolutely... In God's eyes, there's absolutely nothing, no higher price than to offer his son for us. That's the highest price that he could pay. And before he ever created us, he was willing to pay that. And then when it says here that Paul reminded the reader that Jesus died for humanity while everyone was actively actively rebelling against him. You stop and think about that part. Go back in your mind and, and relive Jesus' day of crucifixion, how that went. You know, it's one thing to say that those folks over there in Timbuktu don't like me, don't believe me if they could get, you know, but they're not in, in your face. They're not there. He's not dying for somebody way off over there. He's not dying for somebody down the road. He's dying for those people that are right there in front of him, that are screaming for his to, to crucify him. They're offering up anybody. Ask the people anybody. In, in place of Jesus Christ. Nope. We want him. We want you to crucify him. The, the, the judge, you know, 
Pilate, the, the chief priest, the folks along the path that were throwing stuff at him, stoning him, the people that were beating him, the soldiers that strung him up, the soldiers that made fun of him and, and gambled for his clothes, all of those people that were right there in front of him that he got to experience, he died for them. And then, as he was on the cross, almost, his life was almost given up. And he, and he still found the time and the will to, to express, to please forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that's the truth when he says, I mean, everything he spoke is the truth, but you stop and think about it. They don't know what they're doing. They don't. And fortunately, he has to say the same thing about us. We go through our daily life, and he's like, please forgive them because they don't know what, they, what they're doing. They know not what they do. He knew that that day on the cross, that I'm going to do something tomorrow that's not right that I shouldn't have done. I want to say something that I probably shouldn't say. Not the, and his saying, forgive them because they don't know what, what they're doing, it's going to, he, he knew that what was coming tomorrow. And that would apply to me as well as those right there in front of him on the cross that day. While Jesus struggled to, that's what, to ask God to forgive his enemies since they didn't know what they were doing. You know, again, his enemies. Again, the lost. Those are the enemies of God. He, but God loves them. And that's what he's telling us. That I struggle with this lesson because, I mean, you go through and you read it, and, and everywhere in there he's talking about all this stuff, and it's, it's us. It's me, it's you, it's everybody around us. It just brings home, you know, we... Christmas. Yesterday's Christmas Day. We celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now here we're today, this morning, we're talking about yesterday's oh, you know, Jesus was born, he saved the world, you know, the, all that stuff. And then today he comes home. It's not just to save the world, it's to save me from my sinful life because of the the deeds that I did. Not not that everybody else did. Look in the mirror. That's it says Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary is God's demonstration of love for us. God loved us enough to send his only son to earth to ultimately die on a cruel cross. His death satisfied God's wrath toward us because of our sins. When we come to God with faith in Christ, we acknowledge his love for us with grateful rejoicing, acknowledging that we do not deserve such love. <coughs> It's wonderful to stop and think about that and that his death satisfied God's wrath towards me, satisfied God's wrath towards you. And we think about, I just talked about, there's no description of God's wrath. There's nothing to compare it to. And then we talked about there's not many of us or any of us, you know, you'd give yourself up for someone if you thought they were a good person, but just anybody, you know. But yet we can go out and we can share what God has done for us by sending His Son, Jesus Christ. We can go out into the world around us and share with them the alternative Accept what Jesus Christ did. And the price is paid for you. Or experience God's wrath. And you, we can do that without it costing us anything. It doesn't cost us our life to go and share that with anybody. So why do we stop and, 
since it's not going to cost us our life, it's not going to cost us any energy, it's not going to cost us anything other than a little bit of time to go out and share with someone what God did, what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He was born to save the entire world. That includes you. And to go out, but yet we'll stop before we go and share that with somebody. We'll, we'll start rationalizing in our mind whether or not they're worth our time and our effort to go and talk to them, to go and share with them. Jesus never stopped and thought about it. He, he moved forward his entire life. He knew it was what was coming, and he just kept on taking the steps. But yet we'll stop and wonder. We'll try to decide instead of, it doesn't matter. They're a sinner just like I am. They're lost, just like I was. I need to go speak to them, just like someone spoke to me. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received atonement. He tells us here, because of Christ's work on Calvary, we have been declared righteousness, righteous and are reconciled with our Creator. The relationship we now have with God through Jesus Christ provides joy and peace every day of our lives. Jesus paid the sin debt everyone owes to God, but the payment is only applied through repentance and faith in Him. It doesn't take hours to go and share with someone what Jesus Christ did. It's, it's right there. Because of Christ's work on Calvary, we've been declared righteous and reconciled with our Creator. Because of what He did, we can be reconciled with God. And that relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ provides joy and peace every day of our lives. <clears throat> we all have struggles. We all have problems in our life. And and we all have things that we have to deal with that if it were our own choice, we wouldn't be dealing with them. There's things that we call problems and tribulations coming at us all the time. But at the end of the day, is it not wonderful to know that no matter how bad this is, when it's all over and said and done, we get to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. We get to be in the presence of God after all this that's joy and peace every day of our lives now if I didn't have that I don't know I don't know how a lost person deals with anything in this world I mean, you see you see people going through struggles and you see and you we need to share with them. I've got a. I can tell you how you can find joy and peace in your life, and this is this is where you can find it. Now, it's not going to take away all the problems. We're not promised that. We're not guaranteed. This is a broken world. There's all kinds of troubles here, but we don't have to stay here, and. And we don't have to live an eternity of separation from God. We get to be his neighbor. We get to live in his neighborhood. We get to be just like it used to be. The good old days, the good old days were Adam and Eve walking in the garden, conversing with God in his presence. The good old days are coming again, and that's what, that's what that'll be. When we realize how far Jesus went, to pay for our sins, enduring the wrath of God, so we would not, we should break out rejoicing. Paul wrote that having peace with God through justification by the atoning blood of Jesus causes tremendous joy. Christians who lose their joy have simply forgotten or ignored what God has done for them through Jesus. You get down someday, you have a tough time, 
you, you're struggling with it and you, you get to wondering, you know, just what is it to this life? What's everything all about? Just stop and think about that for a moment. Just think about that Jesus went and paid the price so we don't have to endure God's wrath. That'll start bringing you back around. That'll start, that'll start you rejoicing in what's going on in life. That'll get you to remembering that these tribulations that we deal with, they'll, they do nothing but strengthen our relationship with God. Every bad thing that comes your way gets you a little closer to God, gets you a little bit stronger, gets your faith just a little bit, a little bit stronger. You're a little bit closer every day. It says Christians are tempted to forget the extreme debt God has forgiven based upon the payment of Jesus. Like Peter, we tend to put limits on how often we will demonstrate mercy for people who mistreat us. In that Peter was talking about the servant who was forgiven a great debt, but then he stepped out, and you remember the story, he stepped out and someone owed him, and he had them thrown in debtor's prison, and you know, it's one thing when you ask someone to forgive you for something, but then you turn right around and you show no forgiveness yourself. That's, that's what he's talking about here. We tend to put limits on how often we will demonstrate mercy for people who mistreat us. When we withhold mercy and forgiveness from others, we devalue the extreme debt Jesus paid for us. We must never forget the depth of sin and shame from which Jesus rescued us. We have been declared righteous because of God's mercy and grace. May we never forget what Christ has done. May we live each day in joyful gratitude for justification. May we treat others with the same grace with which God has treated us. There we go. Simple as that. Nothing difficult about all this. As long as we take ourselves out of the equation and put God first in there. That's where we tend to, not where we tend, that's where we mess up. When our first thought is, how's this going to affect me, instead of, how's this going to affect God and my witness for Him, that's when things start getting difficult for us. But when we stop thinking about ourselves first, and we put God first, and then those around us next, and then look at ourselves third. That'll help us. That'll help us to see the joy in our life a little more. When it's God first, and here's an opportunity that we can do something in God's honor and His glory you'll start finding more joy in your life. And I'm doing nothing but looking in the mirror and talking to myself when I say these things. But that's, it's as simple as that. It's God. What can I do for Him today? What can I do for my Savior Jesus Christ today? Because of what He's already done for me. And with that, I'd like for us to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful for this opportunity to study your word. So thankful that you share your word with us and, and most assuredly thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. What he did for each and every one of us by not only living a life as God and as man, but, but willing, knowing what was, what was to come, willing to live that life so that we can have his experiences here to learn from and willing to give that life up for each and every one of us, to die on the cross, to suffer your wrath so that we don't have to. I just pray, Lord, that we will share that with the world around us, that we will look forward to each and every opportunity that you place before us, and that we will, just as your word says, count it all joy. And that we will each and every day endeavor to reach out and strengthen and grow a little that relationship and grow a little closer with you each and every day. I just ask that you'd also bless the services this morning. Brother Donis, the words that you have on his heart, and Brother Seth, what he has to share with us as well today, that it'll all be lifted up in your honor and your glory. 
I ask forgiveness for our failure. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.